thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you so much for this award. Um, this is a huge honor to be amongst uh, the caliber of talented 12 that are here today. So I'm, I'm not worthy. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, especially for nominating or selecting a toxicologist and not even a chemist proper. So thank you very much. All right. So um, my background, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a research toxicologist at the United States Army Center, uh, Edgewood Chemical Biological Center, or ECBC. Our main mission uh, is to support the warfighter in chem bio defense needs. Uh, so that's protection, detection, decontamination of chemical and biological threats. Uh, my background, however, is in opioid toxicology and pharmacology, which is a little bit different than traditional chemical warfare agents. Uh, I'll talk about why, why Edgewood is interested in opioids in just a minute. Um, but of course, everyone now is very interested in and pushing a lot of resources towards fighting this opioid epidemic. And now that carfentanil has hit the illicit uh, drug market and we're finding it in stocks of uh, seized heroin and seized fentanyl, illicitly produced drugs, of course, um, this is a drug that we don't know a lot about. It's traditionally a large animal sedation and takedown tool and not uh, a human clinically used drug. So uh, we don't, there's a lot we don't know about it. But uh, I've, I've put a lot of effort and work into uh, at least uh, gaining some insight into how the, how the stuff works, how bad it is, uh, and what it does and doesn't do. So of course my path, um, you might think, as most of, most of the people here have discussed, is relatively linear. You know, undergraduate to graduate school to employment. Of course, that isn't how I do anything normally. Uh, I took a roundabout way. I went straight out of undergraduate. I earned my BS in biochemistry, took my job at Edgewood Chemical Biological Center, ECBC, right out of college. Uh, it was 2008. The job market was very poor. A job was offered to me, so I jumped on it. And I, I also uh, you know, went in thinking, well, geez, it's, it's the government. There are opportunities to go back to school. Uh, this is a, something that I can use to further my education. And, and sure enough, it was. After a couple of years of working at ECBC, uh, I asked my boss, my boss is, um, you know, I said, hey, I'm interested in toxicology. Uh, we do a lot in toxicology. Can I go get my degree in toxicology? And they said, sure. I said, how? They said, I don't know. Um, so we went back and forth and round and round talking to all kinds of people that I never would have spoken to otherwise. These are people in HR. These are people in Army policy and training from local to my organization to all the way in California. Uh, so this is sort of my message to young people who are, who are in the crowd today, in the, the audience today, and watching this uh, on, on YouTube. Um, ask questions, be persistent, find out who to talk to, uh, and if the people that you're talking to don't know the answer, find out who they can talk to, and, and work your way through the system, because uh, lo and behold, you and they will learn uh, how this process works, and then in the future, people can come to you and say, hey, I heard you did this, how did you, you accomplish that? you can actually have a path forward for them. So that's my, my one motivation uh, to all of the young folks in the audience today is to find out how things work, uh, find out how to make it work for you, and then share that with uh, those who follow. I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, the, or the research that I'm gonna talk about is of course what was done as part of my thesis program while working at ECBC. Um, but first, let's talk about how I even came to know about ECBC or how I got interested in chemical weapons at all. Uh, I was a 21-year-old, you know, junior in college, and I had been three and a half years pre-med, met all my prereqs, I had taken my MCATs, and I realized that all of my friends who were applying to med school were very cutthroat competitive about getting into medical school. And I'm a very competitive person, and I couldn't get passionate about it. Um, but at the same time, I also realized that's probably what makes a really good doctor is someone who, who, who has that scalpel on their hand and knows that they're the very best. So I figured, okay, maybe that's not a profession for me. Uh, I thought graduate school, sure, but what am I going to study? The only thing that I really, really enjoyed, or the one thing that I really, really enjoyed as part of my undergraduate, undergraduate career, I learned from vertebrate, vertebrate physiology, and that was how drugs interfered with uh, neurological pathways, and how those, path, those pathway interruptions or perturbations caused these really weird states of mind. So I thought that poisons and toxins and, and drugs were rather interesting, but I, I didn't know what I could do with those, uh, that skill set or that knowledge base. Um, I lived in Austin, Texas. I was an undergrad at UT. Are there any Longhorns in the audience, by the way? All right, never mind. Hook them for those online. Um, I was in Austin, Texas, so I figured, well, a 1980s cover band guitarist isn't totally off the table, uh, except I'm not that good of a guitarist. So I figured that's probably not the way to go. Um, like I said, I loved learning about and studying poisons, but it was too much to think about at the time. So my roommate and I, who had just about every movie known to man, 
said, all right, I'm going to stop thinking about this. Stop making my head hurt. Let's just watch a movie. And bam, we watched The Rock. <laughs> Has anyone seen The Rock in this room? All right, good, excellent, good people. Um, I learned a couple things from watching The Rock. And this isn't the first time I'd seen this movie. I'd watched it many, many times before. Um, but of course, it's starring Sir Sean Connery, uh, Nicolas Cage, and Ed Harris. Um, and I'm, I don't know how many people in this room can say this, but this movie changed my life. Nicolas Cage changed my life. Um, because in this movie, he portrays a chemical weapons specialist for the FBI. Uh, at this time in my life, you know, like I said, I'd seen it many times before. It was a really cool movie. But at this time in my life, when I'm trying to figure out what I want to do, and a lot of things I had come across you know, are things that I didn't want to do necessarily uh, as a career, I thought, this is a job somewhere. This is someone's job. This is a career. Um, so how do I get there? Uh, of course, I also realized, besides that this is a job, and no matter how outlandish or, or you know, uh, Hollywooded up this movie was, um, that that job did exist, I also realized I have a lot in common with Stanley Goodspeed, who is the character that's portrayed by Nicolas Cage. And that is, we both think that vinyl sounds better than CD. Anybody disagree? Good. Second, we both drove Swedish cars. In the movie, he says that he drives a Volvo, a beige one. I drive a Saab, very similar people. And we both played guitar. So at this point, I'm just like, all right, how do I become this guy? Uh, so how do I get there? Speaking to his false education as well. Again, it's a movie. Uh, I gleaned this from one of the lines in the movie where Director Womack, head of the FBI, is giving his, you know, reading Stanley Goodspeed's resume to his, to his coworker and says, bachelor's in uh, biochemistry from Columbia, PhD, Johns Hopkins University in toxicology. I was halfway there and didn't even know it. I almost had my biochemistry degree. And I'm like, great, now I have a goal to aim for. So now I, I have this target, off in my future, PhD toxicology. All right, how do I do it? Um, at this point also, oh, by the way, Sean Connery gives it his thumbs up of approval. Um, so I get this job at ECBC. I'm working in smoke and riot control agent research. We're not, really, we're not developing anything more of just doing, uh, at the time I was doing a lot of literature reviews, seeing what had been done in the past. You know, these are things that have been worked on since World War II. Uh, so there's a lot of literature to catch up on. Um, so I'm reading about these things. And I, I always had this interest, like I mentioned, from vertebrate physiology in things that alter your state of consciousness. So anesthetics, analgesics, sedatives, hypnotics, things like that. I had this interest. And I wanted to see if there was any application to it within my job in DOD, or Department of the Army. And there was. So in 2002, there was what, was, what is now known as the Moscow Theater Siege, where 40 Chechen rebels uh, stormed into the, the Dubrovka Theater in Moscow and took over 800 people hostage. Uh, and for several days, there were failed negotiation after failed negotiation. And finally, on the fourth day, the Russian uh, anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism police released this mysterious aerosol into the theater, sedated everybody, and then stormed in and separated out the good from the bad. Um, it was this use of, op uh, well, what was later found to be opioids. The, our British counterparts at DSTL, Defense Science and Technology Lab, published a paper in 2012, 10 years after this event, um, based on analysis from British citizens who were at this siege, that the compounds used were carfentanil and remifentanil. And it was this use of opioids as a weapon uh, that a, piqued my interest. Uh, this was shortly after I came on to DOD work. Um, but it also is, it now made this a DOD relevant issue. Uh, so now my personal interest lined up very well with the DOD interest, uh, and I had a research project for my thesis. Um, of course, working for a DOD agency and going to graduate school, uh, you know, I finished all my coursework and it got to this point where I had to decide on a project. So I had to find something that was both DOD relevant and academic enough to where the university would say, yes, this meets all the requirements for a PhD. So we proposed, uh, before I talk about the proposal, one of the jobs of toxicology at ECBC is to generate human estimates for toxicity uh, for chemical warfare agents. And we have to do that without, hopefully, without any human data. Uh, because these are things that are so nasty, so toxic, we would never want to expose people to them. Um, so, of course, we have to do everything using animal models, in vitro systems, in silico predictions. Um, but it's only recently that we've really tried to integrate all three of those methods, um, be it through animal studies, uh, in vitro cell cultures, or our in silico physiologically based pharmacokinetic or PBPK modeling, um, 
to come up with a human estimate. And this was sort of the guinea pig for that, using carfentanil. Um, we looked at metabolism, physicochemical properties, some in vivo work that had been done, and of course receptor pharmacology, plugged it into our in silico model and got a prediction for what happens pharmacologically in the rabbit, because the rabbit was our, our lab animal of choice. Um, and then we switched that in silico model from modeling rabbit to modeling humans. And we changed some of the parameters to model, or to, to rather reflect the physical chemical properties of uh, human solutions and the metabolism of carfentanil in human hepatocytes and microsomes. And we got our human estimates. So this was all done in baby steps, iteratively. Receptor pharmacology, clearance and metabolism, metabolite identification. This was all part of my thesis work. Um, and what it, what it ended up, what it culminated in, was this prediction of toxicity of 0.34 micrograms per kilogram. That's what I calculated as, part, as, as the conclusion to my, uh, my thesis. And that's all well and good, except we had nothing to compare it to, because there is no LD50 in humans for carfentanil. Uh, the closest thing we can get is an extrapolation from fentanyl, which is clinically used in humans. Um, but it was validated after my thesis was published by a DEA paper that came out that cited 20 micrograms of material is required for a lethal dose in humans. Well, if you do the math and you calculate that, or you divide that rather by your prototypical 70 kilogram human, you get an estimated toxic dose or lethal dose of 0.29 micrograms per kilogram. This validated our work very, very well. It meant that we are in the ballpark. Whether it's 0.34 or 0.29, it doesn't matter. What we're saying is this stuff is really nasty. It's very, very toxic. It's not something that people should be doing recreationally, and it also fed a lot of information into our chemical defense program as well. Um, so that's sort of a summary of what I've done. The biggest takeaway, what, what we really aim to do and what we were very successful at doing as part of this research is, like I said, integrating in vitro, in vivo, and in silico methods to come up with a human estimate of toxicity um, for a drug that previously had no data like this out there. Uh, so now we can push that, that method into other compounds that we know nothing about, which is very common, of course, working with chemical warfare agents because, like I said, there's no clinical data on them. So that being said, I'll go through this list very, very quickly because I know I'm going to run over on time, but some keys to what I consider my success. Has anything that I've done been normal? Absolutely not. I made a major life decision based on a Nick Cage movie. So enough said, hopefully, there. Um, most people don't do that. Most people take... Yeah, most people bet on a sure thing, and they take a path to success that's pretty well established. Obviously, there are exceptions to this. You have all the entrepreneurs, some of, a couple of which are in this Talented 12 group with me. Everyone here, I believe, uh, doesn't take that um, typical path of just following the leader. Uh, we are all leaders in this room. That's why you're here today. But um, one of the keys to my success was branching out to do something that, it, that no one else at my organization was really doing, and I had become very successful leading that field of research within ECBC and within the DOD. Um, networking is another key to my success. Why? Because I talked to a lot of people about what I wanted to do with my life, and it was a retired Army colonel, an infantryman, who said, hey, why don't you look at ChemBio research? That sounds like it's right up your alley. And sure enough, he had friends, guess what, in the Army, in the ChemBio arena that I got to talk to, that I got in touch with, that eventually led to, after you know, passing me along from one person to the next, that led to me getting an interview where I eventually came to work and love working still. Um, and maintaining those relationships is important as well, because throughout your careers, you're going to want to collaborate with people. You're going to want to uh, have someone you know over here meet someone over here, and they can collaborate. It's, it's really important to maintain a lot of these relationships. And finally, take all the opportunities that come to you as they come. Uh, if, if you're sitting in your career at whatever point you're in, and you're thinking, wow, in a couple years, I can't wait to move on to this. But if the opportunity comes up today, you should jump on it, because who knows in two years, three years, when you're ready for it, if it'll still be there. And the, the last point I'm going to make is to make opportunities when they aren't arriving, arising for you. Uh, for instance, with graduate school, for me, I, like I said, I said, can I go to graduate school? My boss has said, yeah, absolutely. I asked how, and they said, we don't know. Uh, so we found out how. We made that opportunity happen. Uh, and and now I have people coming to my office saying, hey, I heard you went to graduate school while working at ECBC. How'd you do that? Who'd you talk to? Who should I talk to? Um, so that's a major, uh, I think one of the biggest influences of uh, my success is making opportunities uh, that weren't necessarily offered to me outright. Okay, one last point, sorry. Uh, and that is to be kind 
and to mentor those who are younger than you. That's younger in experience or years, it doesn't matter. Um, like I said, when those people come to my office and ask me, hey, how'd you do this? I can now point to them and say, ah, here's a success, here's how I did it. It may not work for you, you may wanna do something different. Take, pick and choose uh, what you're going to from my advice, but here's how I did it. And that type of mentorship helps. Uh, it helps out, it helps you out, it helps them out. Uh, so everyone ends up being happy in the end. And I think that's it, yes. So with that, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it.